Welcome back. We are behind the magic of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And things have become decidedly damp. Having completed the first stage of the Triwizard Tournament, things really step up a gear as the competitors battle to win this. Ugh! As if fighting dragons wasn't bad enough, this time they're going to have to rescue someone they would sorely miss from the bottom of a very deep lake. Now, you can do pretty impressive things with special effects these days, but the best way to make it look like someone swimming underwater fighting mermaids and sharks is to get them to do just that. Come on, put this down now. Oh. OK, I was joking about really fighting mermaids and sharks, but for this scene, some intensive work was required. Last night, something was stolen from each of our champions. A treasure of sorts. These four treasures, one for each champion, now lie on the bottom of the Black Lake. In order to win, each champion need only find their treasure and return to the surface. Simple enough. Put that in your mouth. Except for this, they will have but one hour to do so, and one hour only. After that, they'll be on their own. No magic will save them. You may begin at the start of the cannon. Of all the things was how are we going to do this? It's a huge undertaking because it's a scene that takes place entirely underwater. Doing it dry meant you had to hang Harry upside down so the hair would fall down, strap him in this terrible machine, and he had no flowing movement at all. But we didn't feel that was right because you didn't get this slowness of motion that you know of hair. This was the only way to go. Then we had to build a tank, uh, not in substantial tank, it's huge. In fact, it's the largest in Europe. Basically, it's 60 feet square, 20 feet deep. It holds uh, half a million gallons of water, four and a half million litres. And then we had to train Dan to swim underwater. I trained for about six months before to try and look as natural as I could underwater because Harry's supposed to become a fish, you know, essentially because he grows gills and webbed hands and things. And then Dan had to act underwater. Now, you know, it's, it's difficult enough acting in any way, but to act underwater is an amazing uh, thing. And not just Dan, by the way, there were, you know, three other kids mm. too who had to do it, but, da you know, Dan more than all of them, obviously. I have the mask on and the, the DV in my mouth, and basically they count down three, two. On three, I blow all the air that I could out of my lungs, and then on about one or breather out, I'd take as deep breath in as I could, and then just chuck the DV away. And it meant time we'd done all those things. It was usually about 15 or 20 seconds acting time. Acting how well, I don't know. I, I like to think I did okay, but I'm not, I just can't be certain. <laughs> Either way, you know, to act badly underwater is hard. Because you're underwater. I've seen some of it, Daniel. Have you? I can't tell you how impressed I was. Really? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very I'm much. I'm really, really impressed. A state-of-the-art filtration system kept chlorine levels to a minimum, which was not only kinder on the actor's eyes, but ensured the water was crystal clear, something essential to the filmmakers. In fact, it was purer than mineral water. But that's not all. I understand that there was some sort of dry room or, or some place where the actors could go to, to save them having to come up to the surface. Yeah, the, there was what we called an underwater habitat, which was a, uh, a small Wendy house, for want of a better term, which had a little window in it, <laughs> um, and a little chimney where um, we could pump air down into it constantly, so we kept the air inside it uh, monitored and pure. It was sort of like a very low-budget version of the Big Brother diary room. <laughs> and basically you go into there and it's a dry place. And my instant reaction was one of complete... Well, I became five years old again and I was going, but it's dry in here and it's Underwater. out there. Yeah. He's going to be in the habitat 15. In the clock Dan was such a sport. But of all the things he's done, I think this was the toughest. You know, at the end of each day, he was like... Poof. While he was doing that, he was studying for his GCSEs. So how much... Time were you actually underwater? Um, coincidentally, I, I oh, do see, actually that's have. how the magicians do yeah, it. Yeah, they just hide behind cushions and things. It's not, they real magic. It's not. It's not very important. No. This was actually the stunt department's Christmas present to me. <laughs> Professional divers' daily record: inland, inshore. So this is actually like a log. 
Yeah, basically it's a logbook. You know, every time I go down, they have to write in what time I go down, what time I come up, and how long I spent underwater. In every day, I could do up to three hours underwater. They counted up how long I actually spent underwater in total and over the three weeks we were filming for about that. 41 hours and 38 minutes underwater. 41 hours and so, 38 minutes in three weeks? Yeah, so very pleased with 2, that. 2,483 minutes? Yes. That's an awesome amount. It's re I'm really proud. I'm very, very proud of that. But not everyone took to it like a fish to water. Stanislav Janewski, who plays Durmstrang champion Victor Crum, had to overcome his biggest fear. Well, I used to have... Um, fear from deep water, um, anything that I couldn't get my feet on. I had to learn how to go down, all the way down, and take everything off and put it back on and do different stunts and spins and everything. So, um, What was that like? Well, at the beginning, uh, it was extremely, I don't know, I was, I was sort of scared. I would and, imagine. Um, you know when you're breathing that oxygen underwater? And yeah. When you breathe it too, too fast and too heavily, you sort of... Get lightheaded. No, yeah, you get lightheaded when you come out. So I got that once. <laughs> and um, I just couldn't clear my mask at the beginning. I would just stop and then it refills, you know, used to get refilled with water and then again and again. It was just difficult. But then um, once I trained in the shower, I said I must get used to water, you know, just. <laughs> so you stood in the head. shower with it on your head? Um, yeah, I just, I was training <laughs> myself in the bath and everything. And then um, the next time I went in the tank, I, I just couldn't do it. And Robert Pattinson, who plays Cedric Diggory, one of the Hogwarts champions, found the experience somewhat disorientating. You can't see anything. All the divers who give you your uh, breathing apparatus, uh, they're all dressed in blue scuba suits. And, so you just, and you're completely blinded by the chlorine. And so uh, you're sort of floating around and doing your thing, and then someone says cut, and you get a thing shoved in your mouth from, <laughs> from nowhere. I don't actually have to do any acting, because I'm, I'm actually... Um, not sleep, but I'm not quite with it until I until I come back up to right. the top. So I just have to splutter around a bit and <laughs> you know swim to the edge. But apart from that, I don't really have to do that much. In fact, the part of Hermione in this scene is largely played by a dummy. We have four principal characters who spend most of their time in the sequence completely anchored underwater. So you can't use real people. Uh, therefore, you have to make dummies. We have Hermione and Gabrielle here, who are silicon dummies designed with chambers inside them so we can send them up and bring them down with buoyancy chambers just like a submarine does and their movements are controlled by what we call aquatronics where we're pumping water through air rams inside them so that there's nothing electronic under the water at all we also had to put gills on Harry and flippers on Harry webbed hands that took a lot of practice whenever you do a makeup that's on an actor, you're dealing with a huge number of problems already. The minute you go underwater with that, you're into quite a whole set of problems, like actor with webbed hands has to be able to hold a regulator in his mouth, you know, to put in his mouth between takes, and the hand mustn't interfere with the safety af aspect of him being able to do that. Likewise, if he's got gills on, they mustn't get damaged if he has to put a mask on and off. Flippers, how do you get him to the pool, out of the pool, you know? That, those things, they're all practical considerations. And then you have to persuade the actor to actually tolerate all of this. Dan, that was really good. Let's do exactly the same as that last one, but this time, do not say the line, just think it. In total, the team spent six weeks filming the underwater material, but that was only part of the story. It was still, you know, a lot of work ahead of us, because all we were doing in the tank was uh, swimming these people around. Uh, of course, there was no mermaids in there, there was no grindelows. But once we had shot all this stuff, it was a matter of taking all these, this footage that had been shot and reimagining all the camera movements that we did, but putting it in the context of being 500 feet underwater, uh, this huge kelp bed that Harry has to swim through, and then the ruins where he has to uh, rescue the different victims. Daniel was filmed sort of fighting nothing, largely, underwater. Uh, we then had to choreograph through all the shots, um, scores of Grindelows attacking him, wrapping their tentacles around him, uh, try and make it look as though uh, he had, you know, he was actually being pulled rather than he was just sort of feigning being pulled and get some interaction on his skin and shadows and hair movement and his, even at one point just made his glasses wobble around so that it felt as though he was being attacked. Uh, and we had a huge number of creatures. I mean, it, 
you know, even a few years ago, just creating one creature like this in a shot was hard work and was, was pushing the boundaries of what computers could do. And in some of these shots, we, we have hundreds of creatures, and uh, to try and wrangle those in a scene and make them all work together to make the drama of the shot has, has been quite hard work, but we're very pleased with the results. Most of the shots we work on, he was shot in the blue screen tank, but uh, there's a few shots where the performance was impossible for a human being to do, or sometimes where it was impossible to get the camera to do what the camera needed to do. And in those shots, we've uh, make, created a computer-generated Daniel or computer-generated other characters to put into the shots. For example, this, I think this, this shot here. This, this shot here where he leaps out of the water, this sequence here, um, Obviously, that's physically impossible, uh, short of firing him out of a cannon. Yeah! <laughs> At 500 feet, water is pretty murky, so muddying up the clarity of every single shot was something else the team had to do. Making these sort of shots successful is all in the detail. It's getting the play of the light that you get, where it's not sort of a static light like it is above water. There's all the ripples and the caustics. Um, there's the grunk floating around in the water, there's the uh, diffusion of light as things get further away, everything gets foggier. We have to add all of this and we, we even go to the trouble of adding um, the imperfections that you get with underwater cameras. Underwater cameras uh, aren't as clear as, as above water cameras so we've uh, analysed you know, what happens with underwater cameras and we add those to some of our, some of our images. <laughs> But he's my friend Tommy. It's been done before, I mean, in the sense that people have shot underwater, obviously, and, and uh, they've even done blue screen, but I don't think to the extent that, that we did it did on here. I mean, we've created this whole uh, eight-minute uh, sequence that, you know, there's, there's not one shot in there that, that wasn't blue screen and that we had to recreate the whole environment. Every shot in that sequence is realized through computer animation, both not, not just the underwater, in fact, but the above water, too, where we uh, created these elaborate Victorian dive stands uh, from Stewart's designs, and, and we uh, put them up in this lock uh, in, in Scotland. And, and we never went up to Scotland once with the, the casting crew for, for any of the uh, footage that you see in the movies. Visual effects on this scene alone took a total of 18 months to complete. But before we pull the plug on it, Daniel has something up his sleeve for me. I think you should have a go. I think everyone will be very, very impressed. I think you'll be letting people down. <laughs> I've spent my life letting people down. I'm not about to change the habit of a lifetime, Daniel. We'll leave go that. on, have a go. No, we'll, we'll leave that just for the time being. I'll look into it. But Daniel wasn't taking no for an answer. He'd arranged for his friends on the stunt team to take me down into the actual tank where the scene was filmed. And they took me through some of the basic techniques that the cast had mastered. I was only in the water for half an hour, and not only were my eyes sore after that short time, but I was genuinely shattered. And I wasn't even acting in a movie. It was a fantastic experience, which gave me an insight into the awesome achievement of everyone involved. After the break, find out how an ordinary school day turned into superstardom for one lucky teenager, and Harry comes face to face with his evil enemy, Voldemort. See you then.